Ramsey TV. Hello everybody. First of all, I would like to thank all of you who contribute to this work, who either contribute automatically, monthly, or you send a check here, or to Stark and Hartman headquarters, or on PayPal. I can't say enough about how thankful I am for you because I could not be doing this without you. You know who you are, I know who you are, and God knows who you are, and it is a grassroots effort. You are fellow laborers together with me in this work. It makes me feel not so alone. It's definitely a token of your love and appreciation of what I do. And it seems like this work gets harder every day. Many days I'm just an emotional mess. I don't know why exactly. I don't know if it's the weight of the world. Uh, the weight of caring for the Ecclesia, the evil in the world, the responsibility of heralding the Word of God accurately, the sheer buildup of the years, 29 years. I, I don't know what it is for sure, but I am straining for the snatching away, as we are supposed to do. But you make everything easier. It would be unbearable without you. And I like to think the same thing you feel about me, and I know that you do because you've told me you can't make it without me. Many of you have said that. You need this daily dose of the truth, so I appreciate that. I need those words as well, so thank you for that. Anybody who wants to contribute to this work to help me get it out, you're never under any compulsion whatsoever. All my material online is free. All the material on my website is free. If you want to contribute, though, you can go to my homepage, and on the top left there, there's some words in red, something about sending Martin a gift for the work. Um, it's always appreciated. Never required. Never. But always appreciated. So thank you, one and all. So the good news is the three new books are ready. They're ready for order. You go to my homepage, martinsender.com. I'll link that down here. I'll link the contribution page down here if you want to do that. But what I'd like to do in the next three days is just give you an overview of these three books. They're all related. That's why I wanted them to all come out at the same time. It has been incredible labor. I mean, I cannot explain to you how difficult it is not to write a book. No, no, no. That's the easy part to get the book to look nice like this and to perfect the appearance, to make it look like a professional book, to make it nice, to make it feel good in your hands, to make it easy to read. It's incredibly difficult. I'd like to thank my sister, Kelly, for the work that she has done and will do to mail those books out to you to my typesetter, Catherine Quintero Torres, without whom, really, these books wouldn't be ready yet, okay? And my proofreader, Drew Costin, who proofread The Lie of Every Man's Battle, which is a scholarly work. It really is. I'm going to explain it to you today. I'll first give you just a quick overview of the three books. Uh, the three books are... The Lie of Every Man's Battle. Shaga. I'm going to explain that title to you tomorrow. Goddess of Nazareth, which is a novel. They're all related, and the topic is sex and relationships. There is an awful awful Christian book that has been circulating for years that uh, the authors Arterburn and Stoker, Stephen Arterburn and Fred Stoker have made an industry out of condemning people by the millions. That book is called Every Man's Battle. The premise of the book is that men, your problem is that you're male. That's your whole problem. And because you're male, you have unique problems 
of course, you wouldn't have these problems unless you read the damn book, Every Man's Battle. Then you will enter into a battle. If you read that book, if you have read it, if somebody has given you that book, you will enter a battle that you are not meant to fight. This is a ploy of Satan. The book, Every Man's Battle, is a ploy of Satan. Because Satan has got Christians focused on the wrong enemy. They're all focused on sex, on the evil of sex, and especially the evil of male desire and male eyes. Those are the, that, that's the enemy, according to the Christian religion and according to the authors Arterburn and Stoker. It is a satanic book, and of course, this is Satan's plan. He gets the Christian world fighting the wrong battle. In the meantime, he works the greatest evil ever perpetrated upon the human race through their midst, and that is eternal torment free will, and the Trinity. These things they put out and they think they're wonderful. But oh, a man who looks at a woman, even with lust in his heart, that is the most evil thing in the world and you must fight it. And so many men have been tricked into fighting a battle that they were not meant to fight. The book, Every Man's Battle, was given to me by my wife in 2008, and I know many men whose wives have given them this book. And I think it's a way for the wives to exact penance or punishment from their men for perceived wrongs. The perceived wrongs would be noticing other women or commenting on the beauty of women, which is completely natural. God is the one who made women beautiful. It's completely natural to look at them and even to desire them. It's what you do with that desire that makes it a sin or not. When David looked out his window and saw Bathsheba bathing and he felt lust for her in his heart, that was not a sin. None of that was a sin. Normal, natural function. In fact, in this book, The Lie of Every Man's Battle, I have a conversation. I think I'll read that to you today if I have time. A conversation between a man and his penis. Yes, in this book, it's the only place you'll find it. It's unnecessary condemnation. The book Every Man's Battle is religious gobbledygook. It's, it's, it's fettered with law and condemnation and guilt. And I'm afraid that many men have bought into the lie. And they've turned their lives into misery. And this book ends up doing... If you follow the advice of Every Man's Battle, it will end up doing the very thing that it purports to prevent, which is divorce or separation or anger issues between the sexes. Because men will eventually resent the bondage they've been put under. It may take a while to surface, but it will happen. Anytime you deny natural urges. I'm not saying doing something about it. I'm saying just denying that they are there. Back to King David. His sin was when he actually stole Bathsheba from her husband. Not only that, but he made sure that her husband was killed in battle. That was his sin, not looking at her, not even lusting after her. And of course, there's a great mistranslated, misunderstood passage, Matthew 5, 28, when Jesus says, if you even look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery against her. That verse has been misunderstood understood so brutally and used as a cudgel on men, on husbands. And of course, I expose the lie of that verse in this book. This book is it's one of the most important books I've ever written. I spent five years writing this book. This book is as scholarly as the first idiot in heaven. This book is loaded with scripture. I especially spend I spent a whole chapter analyzing the word porneia, what it means in scriptural context. I look at every context of that word in the Greek scriptures and I nail it. I nail it. And you will be free. Every man needs to get this book. The follow-up book to this is Shaga. Shaga is how to take the truths that are presented to you in 
the lie of every man's battle. See, I wrote a book against it. When I read that book, it was so hideous, so horrible that I told myself, I've got someday, I've got to write a book against this lie. And I did it. It took five years. But if you want to apply these truths practically, then you buy this book. Shaga will help you with your relationship. I don't care if you've been married 40 years. I don't care if your sexual drive has been hibernating for 40 years. If you want things to awaken in that department, this is the key. This thin little book will bring an excitement back to your marriage that you did not even think possible. This book has been tested by couples and found true. I even tested it in my own life and I'll tell you about that on Wednesday or whenever it is I get to talking about this book specifically. The third book in the series is a novel. It's called Goddess of Nazareth. It's about the intimate relationship of the most famous couple in the world, Joseph and Mary. Now, nobody knows anything about their intimate relationship. Huh, perfect opportunity for a novelist. This is the first novel I've ever written. I wasn't even sure I knew how to write a novel. This is a considerably thick book, it's 110,000 words. But it was my desire to make these people real and to get into their heads and to show them as real people. And I'm gonna give you the details of this book this week. But for now, I want to talk about the lie of every man's battle. I began this book in 2009. I finished it in 2015, 14 or 15. I started it when I was in exile in Greenwich, Ohio, exiled from my own home. I continued it in Colorado Springs, I finished it in Winburg, Pennsylvania. And when I was finished it, I had people read it, and they said, Martin, this book, man, you really nail it. You knock it down scripturally. There's no disputing or refuting it. But they said to me, you really need a woman's viewpoint. I'm like, oh. The problem was I saw that they were correct. They were absolutely right. Because the accusation would be, oh, yeah, well, you're a man. Yeah, well, you're, it's all a man's point of view. To which my response would be, that's all I got is a man's point of view. But I realized that it did need a female voice. And I knew a woman, and I know a woman named Heidi Kolpo, who is a wife and a mother of four. And she also clearly saw the evils of the book Every Man's Battle. And I asked her to contribute to this book. I went through my manuscript, and I marked those parts where I needed a feminine viewpoint, and I asked her to write on this topic here, that topic there, this topic there. And she did it with great insight. Heidi's contributions in this book are priceless. That's why I want women to read this book as well. Because ladies, it will help you understand your man for perhaps the first time in your life. And I think it's important that you understand your man. And again, without that feminine viewpoint, it wouldn't, the book wouldn't have the the pull that it does. I want to read you a passage from this book. You will see the evil of it right away, I think. This book is chock full of il illustrations, by the way. This is a 500-page book. I have some really great illustrations, if I don't mind saying so myself. I like to see pictures when I open books, first thing I look for. I'm like a kid, big kid. And I spent much time finding just the right illustrations for this book. Here's one of them now. You want me to find you another one? Don't mind if I do. Here's Sally Field and Forrest Gump. What's she doing in the book? You have to read it to find out. Let me just flip around. This is one of my favorite illustrations. Why is there a monkey eating a banana? Well, there's a damn good reason for it. You'll find out. 
In this section called The Age-Old Problem of the Eyes, listen to this. This is by Stephen Arterburn. While every man's battle is directed to men, it can also give women a greater understanding of what men are up against as they battle the age-old problem of the eyes. The age-old problem of the eyes. And now, yours truly writes the following. And now, for the first time in history, it is revealed to both men and women, and to God as well, for he had no idea about it, that the organ of sight given humans by their creator, the organ with which humans visually imbibe of the marvelous order and symmetry and beauty of creation, is in fact an age-old problem. Who knew? Let's look for a hint of this in the book of Genesis, shall we now? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Hmm. Maybe I'm reading the wrong version. According to Stephen Arterburn, one of the terrible authors of Every Man's Battle, the verse, the verse ought to say this. So God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. All except for the stupid eyes, which were actually very bad and would prove to be an age-old problem, especially for men. Well, in fact, only for men. Because the eyes of the woman are perfectly fine. Women, for instance, are able to look at flowers with divine-like immunity without ever having to, quote, give men a greater understanding, unquote, about, quote, what they are up against, unquote, when they just can't take the age-old problem of the eyes off of a purple daffodil. Here, then, is encapsulated the premise. This is why I'm reading this passage, because it illustrates for you the premise of the entire book, Every Man's Battle. What God intended for good is, in fact, evil. The fact is, no free man ought to be up against his own eyes. Any man who does enter into a battle with his eyes does so, not by a decree or a plan of God, but by the designs of a self-imposed religious standard devised ultimately by Satan. Satan desires to make drones and slaves out of free people. He has made great strides along this line with the writing of every man's battle. My goal, on the other hand, I don't really like Satan, is to give you real help, teaching you to work with the way God made you rather than struggle your whole life against it. This next section is called The Unnatural Fears and Prohibitions of Arterburn and Stoker. My poor male readers, all my poor male readers ever think about is sex. Do you want to know what your problem is, poor male readers? Do you want to know the root cause of all your trauma? Well, good, because Fred Stoker has figured it out. That's right, the co-author of Every Man's Battle nails it on page 61 in a chapter titled, Just By Being Male. Oops, I gave it away. Yes, that's the problem. You're male. Your maleness is the problem. You were born handicapped, dude. God doomed you to an uphill battle the second your father's disobedient sperm cell penetrated your mother's egg to produce a disobedient Y chromosome. Sorry about your luck. Here is the first paragraph of Fred's Male condemning chapter, and that chapter again is called Just by Being Male. Here's the opening paragraph. Are you ready for this? I don't think you are, but here it goes. Even apart from our stopping short of God's standards, we find another reason for the prevalence of sexual sin among men. We got there naturally, simply by being male. 
Can you believe that? The prevalence of sexual sin among men is due to them being men. According to Fred Stoker, the co-author of this satanic book, Every Man's Battle. We discussed not long ago how God made us the way we are. At the forefront of Revelation, God tells us in Genesis 1, 27, And God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he creates it, male and female, he creates them. Well, at least he got half the thing right, the female half. The male half of the deal was the sin bag. And yet, forgive me, I beg to differ. Here's a list of the things in Genesis that God considered to be good. Genesis 1.4, the light, it was good. Genesis 1.10, the land, it was good. Genesis 1.12, fruits and veggies, it was good. Genesis 1.18, the sun and the moon, it was good. Genesis 1.21, creatures of the sea and air, it was good. Genesis 1.25, ground animals, it was good. Then God creates humanity. It happens in Genesis 1, verse 27. Then in verse 31, God says, And seeing is God all that he had made, and behold, it is very good, except for the man who was a sexual sinner, simply by virtue of being male. Ha <laughs> ha, I added that last part. But I tell you this, the male of day six was just as good as the light of day one and the celery of day three. And my conclusion is, a man's sex drive contains no more sin than a stalk of celery. You can quote me on that. I'm going to say it again so you can pass it along to your friends. Send this video to your friends. Every male listening to me needs this book. A man's sex drive contains no more sin than a stalk of celery. That's because when God created the male on day six, including his penis and the sacs that contain the semen and his eyes, it was all good. And the function of those things is all good. Yes, Adam had a sex drive before the so-called fall of humanity. This will disappoint Arter Byrne and Stoker, I realize. It ruins the whole premise of their book to consider the pre-sin Adam a sexual being. Our beloved authors don't say it in so many words, but one clearly gets the doctrine from every man's battle that the male sex drive is evil, sin suffused, and in desperate need of censure. Adam and Eve do not eat of the forbidden fruit until chapter 3 of Genesis, and yet it is in Genesis 2.18 where God says, quote, not good is it for the human for him to be alone. It is then in verse 21 through 23 of this chapter that God creates Eve, who had breasts, curves, full lips, a vagina, and one hell of a waist-hip ratio. Verse 24 then says, Therefore a man shall forsake his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two become one flesh. Adam and Eve became one flesh about six seconds after Adam looked down, dumbstruck but smiling, at the world's first erection. If only Adam had a copy of Every Man's Battle, then he could have effectively bounced his eyes from Eve. That's right, in the book Every Man's Battle, they present to the poor male reader, soon to become a victim and a slave, in six weeks, Men, you can learn to bounce your eyes from feminine beauty. That's right. It only takes six weeks. As soon as you see a beautiful woman, you bounce your eyes like you're taking your hand from a hot stove. Our friends, parentheses enemies, tell us how we can do this. If only Adam had a copy of Every Man's Battle, then he could have effectively bounced his eyes from Eve. He could have avoided the temptation of sexual sin and could have instead gone off and renamed the hippopotamus or something. Anything to get his mind off his evil nature and those damned breasts of this new human named Eve. Here's a quote from the book Every Man's Battle. 
Buckle up. This sucks. Our maleness brings a natural, uniquely male form of rebelliousness. When Paul explained to Timothy that, quote, Adam was not the one deceived, it was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner, 1 Timothy 2, 14, he was noting that Adam wasn't tricked when he ate of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. Adam knew it, knew it was wrong, but he ate anyway. In the millennia since then, all of Adam's sons tend to be just as rebellious. Just as rebellious. Adam eating of that fruit voluntarily he wasn't deceived and he wasn't rebellious. He did it to join his wife in the realm of sin and death. And that is a picture of Christ surrendering his great estate to join us in the realm of sin and death without being a sinner or being mortal himself. These guys get everything wrong in their book. Everything. They are slaves of the law. They're slaves of their own self-righteousness. And their book just drips with self-righteousness and condemnation for those who can't be as holy as them and bounce their eyes from beautiful women. I write, not true. Adam was not, Adam's was not an act of rebellion, but of love. Adam was not seduced. In eating of the fruit, Adam became a type of Christ who, quote, became sin, unquote, to save us from sin. God had told Adam, You'll remember this, folks, in Genesis, God had told Adam to be fruitful and multiply. But now his wife languished on the other side of the iron curtain of sin and death. Adam knew it was wrong for him to eat of the fruit. But in another sense, he knew how right it was. He had to be with Eve. He could not leave her alone. He could not be fruitful and multiply without her. It was his love for her that compelled him to eat. Listen to more theological fiction. If you can stand it, I hope you haven't eaten breakfast yet because you're going to puke after I read this. Listen to more theological fiction from every man's battle. Your, these are all quotes. Your maleness looms as your own worst enemy, page 71. Our maleness is a major root of sexual sin, page 70. The male eyes give us the means to sin broadly and at will, page 114. Our natural rebelliousness provides the arrogance necessary to stop short of God's standards, page 63. Our natural dislike of the straight life gives us the desire to stop short, page 63. If we get into sexual sin naturally just by being male, then how do we get out? That's their question. How do we get out? How do we get out? Yeah, men, how do we get out of being male? How do we get out of the five quarts of testosterone that God has coursing through our veins and arteries? How do we get out of the fact that God gave us eyes to imbibe of the beauty of the world? How do we get out of the fact that God made the fair sex so beautiful and a reflection of how beautiful he is? How do we get out of the fact that women have breasts and vaginas and curves and long shapely legs, full lips. Oh, if only Adam had every man's battle. Just think, as soon as he looked at it, boom, he could have bounced his eyes and saved us from all this sin that we've suffered since then. I got more to say about this book. I'm going to have to check out, look at the time. Clyde Pilkington gives a great commendation on the back of this book. Clyde says, this is the best book I ever wrote. This book is right up there with First City in Heaven. This is a social problem. I've told you before, if Satan wants to wreck the world, all he has to do is wreck the family. If he wants to wreck the family, all he has to do is wreck husbands and wives. And if he wants to wreck husbands and wives, all he has to do is screw up the topic of sex. And that is Satan's main goal today. Satan's goal today is a, it's a total distraction. It's a false enemy created by Satan. And the enemy is sex and the key player in that problem, so-called problem, it's not a problem, it's the only problem if you make it a problem, is the male who has been cursed, not blessed with eyes, cursed, not blessed with testosterone, cursed, not blessed with a penis that tends to get hard when it sees a beautiful woman. Oh, I told you I was going to give you a, 
a hypothetical conversation between a man and his favorite sex organ, and I'm going to do that, but I'm going to have to do it tomorrow. I'm just going to read you the copy here on the back of the book to let you know what this is about. There's me and my lovely co-author Heidi Culpa. In the popular Christian bestseller, Every Man's Battle, Stephen Arterburn and Fred Stoker warn men they should repress their natural appreciation of feminine beauty for fear of creating a, quote, wall of separation, unquote, between them and the Lord. Now, in this outspoken response, Martin Zender and co-author Heidi Kopel break down the dangers of actually heeding that cautionary advice using scripture common sense, and real-life examples, they challenge you to dig deeper in order to find out what God really wants you to know about sexuality. Even if you haven't read the original book, The Lie of Every Man's Battle can free you from guilt and spiritual bondage as well as help you accept your own sexuality and better understand your partner. Order this book today. Order 10 copies. Give it to every man you know. I'll be back tomorrow. i got to say more about it.